Full disclosure, this is new territory for me. I've never had to do so much research for a video before, and while I have tried my best, there are bound to be errors or things that I missed. If you notice factual errors in the video, please tell me about them in the comments below, and I will pin a comment at the top amending anything that I find. A great deal of this video's research came from a report by Intrinsec, another by Microsoft, a cybersecurity blog, Silent Push, and an analysis by Brian Krebs of Krebs on Security. Those four links will be in the description below, but all of the sources I used will be linked in a public document available in the description, and I will also display them on screen when appropriate. There will also be an ad for the Patreon in the middle of the video, so don't be alarmed. Thank you and enjoy the video. Capitalism is a dirty business. Greed, ambition, and talent. A powerful combination that can often make for some of society's most disruptive groups and individuals. In the modern era, access to a computer can be all one needs to pull off extraordinary things. It can also be all one needs to spread chaos, destruction, and corruption. I will attempt to explain to you how a group of mostly teenage boys managed to infiltrate several of the world's largest and most powerful conglomerates. We will see corporate incompetence, ambitious naivete, and a healthy dose of our system's indifference, even when it comes to juveniles, when this much money is potentially on the table, as we explore a criminal history of the hacker collective known as Lapsus. Due to the nature of this story, several individuals who aren't yet or were not yet 17 at the time of their convictions will be mentioned. Because of this, among other reasons, only online handles will be used for the sake of anonymity. Where exactly this story truly begins is something that's hard to pin down. Every time I thought I knew the answer to that question, the rabbit hole would get deeper. I think I know how Frederick Newton feels now. But the story, as far as the public is concerned, begins with a couple of groups that predate Lapsus, starting with Cyber Team. The earliest breadcrumbs in this story go back to a group called Cyber Team, who were active between 2015 and 2020, and likely based in Brazil. Initially, they mostly conducted doxing operations against public and private companies, or sometimes politicians. Their targets would include companies like the Brazilian arm of the phone carrier Vodafone in May of 2017 and Valve through Steam about a month later. By November of 2020, though, their motivations seemed to shift. The person who seemed to be in charge of cyber team, Zem Bryas, seemed to be starkly opposed to the Brazilian government's COVID-19 policy. They would leak the database for the Brazilian Ministry of Justice and deface the Ministry of Health's website. They may have also leaked information pertaining to the Ministry of Health onto the website Docsbin, which will come up multiple times throughout this video. However, much of what happened with Cyber Team remains speculative on my part. I'm attempting to connect dots, which come from a report on lapses that I found by security company Intrinsec. Now, there remains only a weak link between Cyber Team and Lapsus directly, but Intrinsec posits, and I tend to agree with them, that several members from the group may have gone on to join Lapsus and perhaps make up the group's Brazilian wing, as it were. This would also help to explain the sort of hybrid behavior that we would see from Lapsus as time goes on. So it's possible Cyber Team is their origin in Brazil, but there's one more group we need to quickly look at that might explain the other main half to the group, the one based in the UK. Sometime in early 2021, a user known as Everlyn, or Miku, would found a hacker collective dubbed Infinity Recursion. This group would consist of nine people who collaborated with each other to carry out sim swapping attacks among other malicious intrusions into people's lives. They would seem to be primarily motivated by money, and one of their founding members, a user then known as Peter, would go on to accumulate a vast fortune of Bitcoin from his attackers, setting him up for the next chapter in his cybercriminal career. Peter will go on to become the face of Lapsus. He is a young man we will refer to exclusively as Sigma, as that was the last online handle that he used as far as I could gather. But he has also been known as Peter, White, Alexander, Breachbase, Teapot Tuber Hacker, among many, many, many others. 
We know a lot about him actually, and he will serve as the anchor in tonight's story, but most of the other members of Lapsus, who will be mentioned at various points, have either not been identified, or have been but are too young to be mentioned. Welcome to the world of juvenile hackers. Now, I have attempted to construct a comprehensive timeline of the Lapsus group, but some dates are more disputed than others. I will try to tell you this story as it unfolded for me and wrap everything up with a full view of my timeline towards the end. Just know that some events may have taken place before they were actually announced publicly by a blog or the company or group itself. According to that report from Intrinsec, in May of 2021, a Telegram ID known to be connected with Sigma is used to create a new Telegram account. This account was used to launch Distributed Denial of Service Attacks, or DDoS attacks, a common way to disrupt an online service by overloading the server with requests until it craps out and forces itself to reset. This is likely the origin of the Lapsus Group Telegram account, although clearly not the origin of Sigma's hacking. Now, throughout their time in the limelight, Lapsus would make extensive and near-exclusive use of the instant messaging app Telegram to announce their hacks to the world. I don't use Telegram myself, and I'm not giving them my phone number to make an account, but my understanding is that it's a lot like Discord, and is predominantly used in large parts of Eastern Europe, Asia, and India, but also all over the world. Anyway, I'll mostly be pulling screenshots of their Telegram announcements rather than navigating to their group myself, if it even still exists, which, if it does, it's certainly heavily monitored. The next subject is a person I will refer to as Amtrak. All you need to know now is that Amtrak is slightly younger than Sigma, and the two likely both live in the UK. I won't speculate on the reasons why, but what we know is that both young men were on the autism spectrum, and more importantly, were also chronically online, often spending 10 plus hours a day browsing forums, and sinking deeper and deeper into hacker culture. Sometime in July of 2021, Sigma and Amtrak would meet online and pretty quickly develop a friendship, or at least a relationship of some kind, since Sigma never seemed to consider or treat Amtrak as a friend. But friends or not, the two would start working together on various shady activities, most prominently sim swapping, which as I've mentioned allowed Sigma to accumulate thousands upon thousands of dollars in Bitcoin that he would apparently rarely, if ever, actually use. Much of this early narrative that I'm painting is speculative based upon the information I was able to find. I could not determine exactly when Sigma or Amtrak's first attacks would have been, how long they'd been doing it prior to meeting, how much money exactly Sigma had already accumulated by the time, or what forums the two met on, etc, etc. Throughout this video, there will be many events which Lapsus as a group takes credit for, and although Sigma will go on to be the face of the group and usually control the accounts actually called Lapsus, he would not, by any means, be the only one conducting attacks. This was very much the Lapsus group, and part of the benefit to this, to the group itself, was plausible deniability, and decentralization. By August 1st, the group had chosen a name for themselves, and they'd chosen their first target. They were ready to begin in earnest as the Lapsus group. That day, on August 1st, 2021, the members of this new group would infiltrate British mobile phone operator and internet provider EE, a brand under the BT group. They would use that SIM swapping technique that I mentioned, which usually involved spamming multi-factor authentication requests or similar methods. They would then gain access to internal EE servers and begin taunting the company and their customers. They would also apparently steal as much as $100,000 in cryptocurrency from various customers and employees' accounts. We are Lapsus. Remember our name. We have your user data. They announced to the world in a message distributed to at least 26,000 BT Group customers. We have EE's, BT, and Orange source code. If EE pays us 4 million US in XMR before the 20th of August, we will delete everything from our servers. No ransom was ever paid by the company, but this was only their first, very ambitious, and very audacious move. Much more was still to come, but first, we gotta talk about Docspin. Now, Docspin was a website specifically meant to facilitate and encourage doxing, or the releasing of personal, private information on a person to the public. Now, as I've said, Sigma had managed to amass a veritable fortune in cryptocurrency, likely using many of the methods that he would go on to use in Lapsus. Sim swapping, ransomware, illegal online trading, 
However he did it, he'd managed to save enough money, by age 16, to purchase the website Docspin from its previous owner, a person already well known in that community as KT. According to KT, this happens sometime in November of 2021, though at least one source claimed this actually happened as early as September of 2020, and Intrinsec's report seems to imply it was in May of 2021. As far as I can tell, the person claiming it was in September 2020 is wrong and either meant to say 2021 or misremembers the timeline, but then Intrinsec's claim for this happening in May further makes things confusing. KT on the other hand points to this happening sometime in November of 2021, which as far as I can tell makes the most sense, and lines up most accurately with everything else that I looked at, so I'm not sure. I could be wrong here, or maybe this briefy person is wrong, or maybe Intrinsec is wrong. It isn't really clear, but what is clear is that at some point between September of 2020 and November of 2021, Sigma purchased Doxpin in its entirety from KT. Assuming this happens in November 2021, Lapsus is now known in certain corners of the web. Its unofficial leader owned one of the internet's shadiest websites, and they were already making smaller, less noticeable moves on the dark web, and beyond, by the end of November. They would also continue to expand. As far as I can tell, there are only seven people who were ever officially tied to Lapsus in the UK, two of which are Sigma and Amtrak, but using apps like Telegram, they would recruit members from across the world. By December of 2021, they had recruited somebody who I will refer to as PG, because all we really know about him is that he was likely Lapsus' main contact in Portuguese-speaking Brazil. It seems at least possible, though, that PG was a founding member of Lapsus, and may even be the group's connection to Cyberteam. This is once again speculation on my part, though. But now we have come to the first truly public and well-known incident associated with Lapsus, their attacks on several Brazilian government offices. In December of 2021, people all over Brazil attempted to access their government's website for the Ministry of Health, this address shown on screen. Upon navigating to the site, however, users were greeted not by the government's normal, boring website, but instead by a message simply reading, contact us if you want your data back, as well as an email and telegram address left by the attackers. Now, it's possible that this attack was carried out by or led by the person that I've called PG, the most active Lapsus member in Brazil. It's also possible that this attack was carried out by the same person or people who were a part of Cyberteam that attacked the Ministry of Health, among other places, in November of 2020. It could also also be the case that the November 2020 attack and possible subsequent leaks to Doxpin facilitated the December 2021 attacks, or that the two are not directly connected at all, but given the timeline and actors involved, it's once again my speculation that this is Lapsus' connection to Cyberteam. The attack would take place at 1am on December 10th and be the first time the group displayed their signature warning, but the message would be removed by 7am that morning. The website, however, would remain unavailable for the rest of the day, causing disruptions for people all across the country and the world, as one of the many databases compromised during the hack and now unavailable contained vaccination data. Tens of thousands of people's days would be disrupted for the worse. Perhaps some catastrophically so. Approximately 50 terabytes of data had been obtained by the hackers, from not just the Ministry of Health, but several other government bodies, including the Ministry of Economy, the Comptroller General of the Union, and the Federal Highway Police. As will be the case with most of the attacks we look at tonight, it isn't clear if any ransom was ever paid out to recover the lost data, but it seems highly unlikely. It is my own opinion that this likely never happened, and was probably not even ever considered seriously by those with the authority to make such a decision, but Lapsus was just getting started. The nature of the attacks on the Ministry of Health, which seemed to have some stance of opposition to the Brazilian government's COVID-19 policy, is one more reason I think this attack was connected to the November 2020 attacks by Cyberteam. Those attacks, carried out mostly by Zimbrias, also seem to be politically motivated, although I couldn't determine whether or not Zimbrias or Cyberteam had demanded a ransom as well, which Lapsus certainly attempted to get, even if they weren't ultimately successful. Two weeks later, on December 23rd, Lapsus would claim responsibility for taking down the Brazilian National Post Office website for the company Correos on their Telegram channel. 
However, unlike the Brazilian Ministry of Health attack and most attacks Lapsus would go on to conduct, they did not leave a message in Portuguese on the downed website, and it does not appear as though they actually acquired or deleted any of their data. A week after that, on December 30th, they also claimed to have accessed and or stolen as much as 10 petabytes of confidential information, or 10,000 terabytes, from Claro and Embertel Telecommunications, one of Brazil's largest telecommunications companies. Lapsus had been using their telegram in the days and weeks prior to this attack to apparently try to recruit employees of Claro, and may have actually succeeded, claiming afterwards to have obtained data from customers to include customer information, legal documents, emails, source codes, confidential court orders, and wiretapping recordings. As would become typical for Lapsus, they would demand to be paid in cryptocurrency in order to delete the illegally accessed information. Once again, it isn't clear if any ransoms were ever actually paid, though. This technique of social engineering as it is known in the cybersecurity world would also become a trademark of Lapsus. While they had many actors across many countries, something that mostly unified them was the lack of sophistication in their methods. While at least one former Lapsus member has claimed to have had actual ransomware in a pre-Lapsus era, for most of their existence they relied mostly on things like sim swapping and other social engineering methods to compromise the weakest links in a company's security chain, people. They pulled a very similar job on the Portuguese media conglomerate Impresa a few days later on January 2nd, 2022, using a fraudulent phishing campaign in order to get their hands on valid credentials. They would specifically access the Twitter accounts and emails of Impresa's news brand, Expresso. Lapsus is officially the new president of Brazil, they tweeted, also tweeting out their Telegram account and leaving a message on the company website and once again demanding monetary compensation in exchange for ceasing to distribute information that they obtained from the company's AWS servers. Remember Docspin? Well, by January of 2022, only months after purchasing it, according to KT, Sigma would in the eyes of the site's community completely run it into the ground, and in the process destroy any reputation he himself had among the Docspin crowd. Sometime in between January 1st and 5th of 2022, KT would manage to purchase the site back from Sigma at a massive loss to the Lapsus leader. Frustrated and bitter, on January 5th, 2022, while still in control of the official Docspin Twitter account, Sigma would attempt to put a bounty out on KT's own docs, but hours later, KT would regain control of the Twitter, mock Sigma, and then shut the account down, completely, due to not being able to change the internal email or password. In a final juvenile attempt to get even, Sigma would then leak the entire Docspin database, which, according to KT, cost the young hacker at least $75,000 US. This was almost certainly one of the things that ultimately brought Sigma and Lapsus down. Shortly after this, men begin showing up to Sigma's real-life home, and as a result, he begins claiming to have moved to Spain, though it seems unlikely this was ever true. He had now made some very serious enemies, and was perhaps getting in a bit over his head. On January 8th, 2022, KT and several other higher-ups at Docspin collaborated to release one of the site's most comprehensive and invasive leaks in its history. Contained within this post were pictures and videos showing that people had done their extensive and very disturbing due diligence by going to Sigma's home, and publishing information on nearly every one of his immediate family members. None of this, though, would initially work to slow Sigma down, who was realistically just getting started. On January 11th, Lapsus exercised their more comedic side when they hacked one of Brazil's largest car rental companies, Localiza, using a symbol DNS spoofing attack, and redirected people who attempted to visit the company's website to a porn site. Nice. A little backstory. In the corporate world, there is an increasing need for authentication services online, and as a result, there is an entire industry around providing existing companies with the resources to handle authenticating potentially thousands or millions of users across the globe. 
One such company was a customer service corporation called Citel Group, which in turn had a smaller subsidiary called the Sykes Corporation. I know, I know, companies are boring as hell, but stay with me. Now, since these events took place, the Citel Group has rebranded itself and all of its subsidiaries under the name Foundever, making things even more confusing, but I'll try to explain as best I can. Citel isn't actually the focus here, it's one of their clients, a massive authentication company called Okta. Sometime in January, members of Lapsus claimed to have gained access to a support engineer's laptop, one working for Sykes, for Citel, for Okta. Through this support engineer, Lapsus claimed to eventually obtain super user admin access to all of Okta's systems for approximately two months. When word of this hack eventually reaches the public though, in about two months, in March of 22, Okta will claim that Lapsus only ever had access to limited tools that their support engineers had, and that it only lasted about five days and not two months. Okta would actually be the ones to initially detect something suspicious and bring it to Satel's attention. Satel would then acknowledge the hack with a breach notification to their customers, including Okta, and begin preparing a intrusion timeline to give their customers a more detailed report of what took place and what was compromised. This timeline wouldn't be given to Okta by Satel until March 17th, but apparently Okta would sit on this information for four days before being caught off guard when the hackers published supposed proof of their crimes in the form of screenshots showing internal Okta systems. These screenshots would quickly circulate the internet, and before Okta knew it, their opportunity to get ahead of the disaster was lost. Forced to acknowledge the severity of the hack publicly, Okta disclosed that approximately 2.5% of its customer base had been affected, and continued to try and downplay just how much information had been stolen or accessed. The thing is, Okta today has about 19,000 customers at the time of writing. In 2022, at the time of the hack, they still had about 15,000 customers, including big names like T-Mobile, Nordstrom, MGM Resorts International, and the goddamn US Department of Justice. So, by the roughest of estimates, 2.5% of 15,000 customers, which I remind you are not individual people but entire companies, is still almost 400 different corporations whose data was compromised. So, remembering that it is in Okta's best interest to downplay the situation, let's look at the supposed intrusion timeline. From Okta, this is what they say happened. January 20th, 2022, 11.18 p.m. Okta detects some suspicious activity on a Satel employee's Okta account. The intruder doesn't accept a multi-factor authentication challenge and is prevented from accessing the Okta account. About 30 minutes later, at 11.46, Okta security investigate and escalate the severity of the situation to a security incident. Another 30 minutes later, at 12.18 a.m. on January 21st, additional measures are taken to restrict the compromised account's access. Ten minutes after that, the account is completely suspended until the cause of the suspicious activity could be identified. Later that same day, on January 21st at 6 p.m., Okta Security informs Satel of their compromised account, and Satel claims to have already hired a private, leading forensic firm to investigate the incident. Then, between January 21st and February 28th, this unidentified forensic firm would conduct their investigation and deliver the report to Satel, dated March 10th, 2022. A week later, on March 17th, Okta receives a summary of Satel's upcoming report about the incident, and for some reason, Okta does seemingly nothing for five days. Then boom! On March 22nd, images are published online by Lapsus showing screenshots of the compromised accounts in question and the hacker group's own narrative on what happened begins to emerge. Then, by what I'm sure is complete coincidence, that same day Okta finally receives the full report on what happened in January, but by then it's a bit late. Now, supposedly, again, according to Satel's reports to Okta, the intrusion had lasted for five days, between January 16th and January 21st, when it was detected. Without having full access to every piece of internal documentation on both sides related to the incident though, it's hard for a layperson such as myself to know what really happened. 
Okta claimed that the absolute most number of customers affected was 366, but also claimed that this accounted for all legitimate support given by Satel during the time in question as well, and just overall, as I've said, they downplayed things. Like I said though, information about the Okta hack wouldn't actually become public for another two months. For now, let's return to January of 2022. Just been On January 22nd, Sigma and Amtrak were both arrested for the first time and then released under investigation. As far as I can tell, Amtrak and Sigma never met in real life, but Given that they were arrested at the same time on multiple occasions, it seems likely that the two live close to each other, and thus both in the UK, as they were both arrested by the London police multiple times. Something worth mentioning here is I don't know 100% that the person who used the name Amtrak is the same person who was arrested here alongside Sigma. This second person remains unidentified due to being younger than 18 at the time of his arrests, and at times, in my research, I was referring to him as UT. However, as best as I can tell, Amtrak and UT are likely one and the same, so I will continue to refer to this unidentified teen as Amtrak. The next three attacks, as far as I could tell, were never officially confirmed to have been conducted by Lapsus. They didn't feature the same kinds of ransom, and the affected companies' websites didn't feature the trademark lapses page, but there are a number of things that point to them being responsible nonetheless. Early in the morning, on February 6th, several websites associated with the Brazilian Cafina group were taken down by the hackers until late into the afternoon. Sites affected included Correio de Mania magazine, Sabado, Jornal de Negocios, and CMTV. I'm sorry for my butchering of pronunciation, but it was either that or horrible translations, but I suppose there's a healthy mix of both in this video. On February 7th, a Nepalese cybersecurity company, Virav, reported on an apparent ransom note, sent through email to an unidentified Nepalese company. The way they phrased it, the Victim Organization of Nepal. This note was sent by the Saud Group, another name that the Lapsus Group was known to occasionally use and apparently claimed to have compromised this victim organization's IT infrastructure and erased internal data. This was only reported on by Virav and later was included in the report by Intrinsec, but other than that was very much off the radar. And as far as I could tell, there was only ever one instance in the Lapsus Telegram chats of somebody mentioning an attack on Nepal. Finally, on February 9th, Vodafone Portugal suffered a major cyber attack, which left their customers unable to, quote, make voice calls, send text messages, use the internet, or access cable TV. These outages even extended to emergency services attached to Vodafone, including ambulance and firefighter dispatch services. The attack didn't have Lapsus's trademark website message, and no ransom was ever demanded, but about a month after this attack, Lapsus would make a poll on their telegram asking their audience what they should leak, and Vodafone's source code was listed among them, leading many to believe that they had been responsible. If this was them, it was arguably one of, if not their most, harmful attack, since it very well could have led to people actually dying because they were unable to call for help. It's attacks like this which demonstrate the conflicting nature of the group, which I mentioned early on. It's also attacks like this which further convince me that the person that I refer to as PG came from Cyberteam, and was responsible for most of the Lucifone country attacks. Those often seem to have more of a malicious intent behind them, and often more dramatic, drastic, sometimes political consequences, intentionally so. This is in contrast to the hacks usually associated with Sigma that tend to focus on obtaining source code for the purpose of bribery or simply for gaining notoriety. Moving back to ones that we actually know happened, on February 19th, Lapsus also announced that they had hacked retailer Submarino and their subsidiary Americanas, taking down their website seemingly for shits and or giggles before moving on to something much bigger. On February 23rd, 2022, NVIDIA began to suffer dramatic outages to its email and developer tool systems. They were the next victim of lapses. Unlike Okta though, NVIDIA would almost immediately make customers aware of the intrusion due to heightened concern about cyber attacks in the US with the beginning of Putin's war in Ukraine the very next day on February 24th. 
Though this was initially the suspected reason behind the attack, it would eventually become clear that it was actually Lapsus who was responsible, when on March 3rd, 2022, they began releasing usernames and cryptographic hashes for more than 70,000 NVIDIA employees. With apparently up to one terabyte of NVIDIA's data, Lapsus would then begin making some of the strangest demands in the history of cybercrime. They would initially demand that NVIDIA make a specific change to their upcoming graphics cards, which would make them better for cryptocurrency mining. See, a year prior, in February of 21, NVIDIA had introduced a change into most of their graphics cards, which discouraged them being used by crypto miners. They would introduce the NVIDIA CMP, or Cryptocurrency Mining Processor, product line for professional mining. GeForce was for gamers, and CMP was for miners, as far as NVIDIA was concerned. Days later, Lapsus would modify their demand to NVIDIA, now asking them to make all of their future chipsets completely open source. And this is where I start to get a little lost in the details, since I am not privy to all of the jargon from the communities who understand this part better than I ever will. In May of 22, NVIDIA would indeed begin making their chips open source, beginning with their Linux line, and again, as far as I can tell, this has continued for most new NVIDIA products. But there seemed to be a fair bit of healthy debate amongst graphics card aficionados as to whether or not this was a good thing, or whether or not it was related to Lapsus' demands, but I could not find a consensus. On March 4th, 2022, just a day after releasing NVIDIA's data, Lapsus would keep the momentum going, with Samsung. Posting to their Telegram, they would announce the release of about 190 gigabytes of stolen Samsung data, most notably relating to the function of several critical applets in Samsung's Galaxy line of smartphones. This leak would contain the source code for every single trusted applet installed on Samsung devices, to include algorithms for all biometric unlock operations, bootloader source code for all recent Samsung devices, Samsung activation server source code, Samsung Accounts Full Source Code, and other highly sensitive data, including, according to them, the source code for Qualcomm, an American semiconductor manufacturer. Unlike NVIDIA, though, it doesn't appear as though Lapsus made any of their blackmail demands, or even contacted Samsung prior to the breach. Also unlike NVIDIA, this leak didn't directly contain any customer information, something Samsung would cling to when doing damage control. Quote, According to our initial analysis, the breach involves some source code relating to the operation of Galaxy devices, but does not include the personal information of our customers or employees. This next one is a bit unclear. All the reporting on this hack took place in March, but reports from Intrinsec, among others, point to it actually taking place much earlier in the timeline, sometime before December 23rd, 2021, technically making it the second well-known incident associated with the group. The public reporting, which began on March 7th, 2022, a few days after the NVIDIA hack, made it seem like the two happened immediately after one another. Whatever the case, in the headlines, the March Madness continued when it was announced that the largest e-commerce company in Latin America, Mercado Libre, or Free Market, was hacked, compromising the company's source code for its website and associated payment platform, Mercado Pago, or Payment Market. Similar to Okta, Mercado Libre would attempt to downplay the fact that data from more than 300,000 customers was accessed since the company's total customer pool approached 140 million. In addition, Lapsus would claim to have 24,000 source code repositories for both Mercado Libre and Mercado Pago, though it seems unclear to me if any of this ever amounted to anything. We would eventually learn that Lapsus was likely responsible for the Mercado Libre hack, along with the otherwise uncredited Impresa and Vodafone hacks, thanks to a poll they conducted on their Telegram channel. They would ask their audience to decide what information they should release, with the options being the Vodafone, Impresa, and Mercado Libre source codes. Apparently planning to close the poll on March 13th, but I couldn't find any further information on these three hacks related to the poll. This also seems to further support the idea that the hack took place in December of 21 rather than March of 22, with most of the Lucifone country attacks all taking place relatively close to one another, rather than Mercado Libre being hacked in the middle of the various tech companies that were being targeted in early 2022. This video and all videos on my channel are brought to you in large part by the wonderful support of my patrons on Patreon.com. 
An extra special thank you to my executive producer tier patrons, Ezra Hambrick, Mason Collin, Chuck K45, and King GTA 15, as well as my Walker Villain tier patron, Michael Vandenberg. Patrons at these tiers also have the option to promote a little bit of their own content, so this video is brought to you by Ezra's Let's Play channel, Scott Games 99, Mason Collins' podcast channel, We're About Everything, and Chuck K45's Upstart Farming channel. I release all videos a little early to patrons, and completely uncensored. I give you any of the original music tracks I've created for a given video, and for extra generous supporters, you can even reserve a slot for your favorite game in my ongoing series, The Game Vault. You'll also get to see your name in the credits of all videos that are produced while you're pledged, get access to a small patron-only Discord where you can easily speak with me or see little behind-the-scenes snippets, and you'll receive my eternal gratitude. Seriously, especially these days, those of you who support my work directly are absolutely incredible, and I can't properly express how grateful I am to you all. Thank you so much. Patreon.com forward slash The Criminal Historian. Tech companies such as the gaming giant Ubisoft, who on March 10th, 2022, confirmed that sometime the week prior, they had suffered a cybersecurity incident, which temporarily disrupted some games, systems, and services. I couldn't confirm exactly when this disruption to Ubisoft services actually occurred, but The Verge reported it on Thursday, and the next day, Friday, March 11th, Lapsus would seemingly take credit for the event by reposting a link to The Verge article on their Telegram, with a winky face emoji. According to both Ubisoft and Lapsus themselves, customer information was not accessed, and the whole thing seemed to have been done simply for funsies. There is an absolutely fantastic report by Krebs on Security in which they reviewed dozens of chat logs between the prominent members of Lapsus during the last week of March. Thanks to Brian's reporting, we start to see some more specific and individual personalities in this next incident from those chat logs. Sometime between March 17th and March 28th, Lapsus infiltrated the network of American phone company T-Mobile, likely by purchasing employee credentials on sites like Russian Market. The goal seemed to be to obtain access to internal company tools so they could conduct a SIM swapping attack in which a malicious actor intercepts their target's text messages and phone calls, sending them to a device under their control. This would allow them to try and ransom back these accounts for payment. However, it's here we start to see a conflict between the supposed leader or frontman of Lapsus and the rest of its members, whose priorities seem to be quite a bit different. The supposed ringleader, Sigma, aka White, seemed to be primarily, and perhaps only, interested in getting his hands on source codes, as they'd done in the past. What's more, he seemed to want to do this mostly just for the clout. Even though he had apparently amassed as much as $100,000 worth of bitcoins in the past, and by all reports had plenty of money sitting in his accounts, the teen hacker still lived with his parents, who were completely unaware of his apparent net worth. For Sigma, it was all about the attention. It was all about him. There seems to be three important elements to the Lapsus machine. The silent, more advanced users seeking payment through ransom above anything else, with little respect for or interest in Sigma's agenda, the roughly six sycophantic teens who surrounded and to an extent worshipped their frontman leader, and that frontman leader himself. Sigma, along with Amtrak, would gain access to the T-Mobile company tool Atlas, and tensions between the two would start to rise. Actually, they had started even before Sigma got into Atlas, with Amtrak apparently paranoid that his parents would see the T-Mobile logo on his screen and know what he was up to, since they already knew that he had done SIM swapping. When Sigma did get into Atlas, he almost immediately began trying to look up accounts associated with the FBI and the US Department of Defense, with the apparent intention of conducting SIM swaps on them. Just one more piece of evidence that Sigma was not nearly as much of a criminal genius as he painted himself. 
The rest of Lapsus would manage to talk him out of doing this though, and instead, Sigma would infiltrate T-Mobile's Slack and Bitbucket accounts, downloading roughly 30,000 source code repositories over the next 12 hours. So technically this hack had been successful, but once again, nothing seems to have ever come from it. No actual demand ever ended up being made, and T-Mobile's response seemed to indicate that whatever Lapsus had gotten their hands on had been useless. Quote, Several weeks ago, our monitoring tools detected a bad actor using stolen credentials to access internal systems that house operational tool software. The systems accessed contained no customer or government information or other similarly sensitive information, and we have no evidence that the intruder was able to obtain anything of value. Our systems and processes worked as designed, the intrusion was rapidly shut down and closed off, and the compromised credentials used were rendered obsolete. Now of course that's what the company is going to say, but most of the sources I read, including the most detailed one by Krebs on Security that I mentioned earlier, seem to indicate that this attack had been all tell and basically no show. Whether this puts Sigma or the rest of Lapsus on the FBI slash DOD's radar is anyone's guess, but I'm pretty sure they were already very much aware of them before this, and if anything, this simply helped authorities to confirm what they probably already knew by this point. It isn't clear exactly when, but sometime between March 20th and 23rd, Lapsus would attempt fruitlessly to gain access to support outsourcing company i based in St. Petersburg, Florida, by once again purchasing credentials on Russian market. i like most of the companies that Lapsus had thus far targeted, relied heavily on Mobile Device Management Systems, or MDM. These systems most often take the form of only allowing devices approved or issued by the company to access their internal virtual private networks. Most of the time, Lapsus would be able to bypass these systems by purchasing the right credentials and then parlaying their way into greater access or digging deeper themselves. They didn't always get lucky though, and it seems like most of their success in the past had almost entirely been reliant on that factor. With i though, whatever credentials they'd purchased wouldn't be enough to get them the access they wanted, and actual i employees would continue to deny the attempted intruders at every opportunity, until they eventually just gave up and moved on. What they moved on to, though, was a much bigger fish, Microsoft. Likely using all the same methods they'd grown accustomed to, Lapsus would make their way into internal Microsoft servers and immediately begin advertising this to their Telegram audience. While downloading a list of Microsoft source code repositories, they would be cut off by the company, who claimed to not only have been made aware of the download thanks to the group's own public disclosure, but also that they had been monitoring the group's actions in the weeks prior to this particular intrusion. Lapsus, and what seems to have been Sigma specifically, would download the source code repositories in alphabetic order, and thanks to that public announcement be cut off rather quickly, only able to release sensitive information for Microsoft products like Azure, Bing, and Cortana since they're at the beginning. Quote, this week, the actor made public claims that they had gained access to Microsoft and exfiltrated portions of source code. No customer code or data was involved in the observed activities. Our investigation has found a single account has been compromised, granting limited access. Our cybersecurity response teams quickly engaged to remediate the compromised account and prevent further activity. Microsoft does not rely on the secrecy of code as a security measure, and viewing source codes does not lead to an elevation of risk. The tactics Dev0537, or Lapsus, used in this intrusion reflect the tactics and techniques discussed in this blog. Our team was already investigating the compromised accounts based on threat intelligence when the actor publicly disclosed their intrusion. This public disclosure escalated our action, allowing our team to intervene and intercept the actor mid-operation, limiting broader impact. Now, who knows exactly when the FBI began keeping an eye on Lapsus, but in my opinion it was certainly before this, their first official report on the group. On March 21st, 2022, the FBI posted on their website, quote, the Federal Bureau of Investigation is asking the public for assistance. In an investigation involving the compromise of computer networks belonging to United States-based technology companies. 
On March 21st, 2022, individuals from a group identifying themselves as Lapsus posted on a social media platform and alleged to have stolen source code from a number of United States-based technology companies. These unidentified individuals took credit for both the theft and dissemination of proprietary data that they claim to have illegally obtained. The FBI is seeking information regarding the identities of the individuals responsible for these cyber intrusions. This was very clearly in direct response to their attack on Microsoft, who definitely were well aware of lapses before this, whom they had been referring to as Dev0537 or Strawberry Tempest for months. Microsoft was also definitely in contact with the FBI throughout much of this, so it seems likely that March 21st was simply the tipping point, when the United States Federal Bureau of Investigation finally came out and said, all right, you've crossed the lines, now we're coming for you. That same day, on either March 21st or 22nd, Lapsus also infiltrated LG Electronics, and claimed that it was the second time they'd hacked them in one year, but it's unclear what the first incident they're referring to is. They threatened to dump the hashes for all LGE employees and service accounts, but seemed to once again make no ransom demand at all. LG would acknowledge the hack, but claim that no leakage of customer-related information has been confirmed so far. In response, Lapsus would post to their telegram and cheekily claim, might be a good idea to consider a new CISERT team, Computer Security Incident Response Team, releasing nearly 90,000 names in English in that same post. But now, the FBI was involved. Lapsus had pissed off big money, and the House of Cards finally began to come tumbling down, slowly but nonetheless inevitably. On March 24th, 2022, seven teenagers were arrested by the London police. One of these seven was suspected to have been Sigma, as reported by the BBC and other outlets, but as became clear later, this was more likely simply the day that the London police chose to announce, with all seven teenagers questioned and arrested at different times over the course of several months in early 2022. This did not, however, constitute the entirety of lapses, by any means, as there always was, and perhaps continues to be, some more experienced actors behind the scenes, taking advantage and reaping the benefits without any of the consequences. These seven teenagers were simply the scapegoats. Even if these seven members had been the entirety of Lapsus, it wouldn't have mattered much, since they would all presumably be released once again, with Sigma's father specifically being quoted as saying, I had never heard of any of this until recently. He's never talked about any hacking, but he is very good on computers and spends a lot of time on the computer. I always thought he was playing games. We're going to try and stop him from going on computers. Meaning that at least Sigma was released back into his parents' custody and as we'll see, he simply jumped right back into it with zero hesitation. Perhaps just to wet his toes again, perhaps in pursuit of some grandiose agenda, but just days after his arrest in late March, Sigma would find his next target in Brazil's leading fleet management and freight security company, Sascar. On March 28, 2022, Sigma would buy his way into Sascar systems and steal several gigs worth of source code data. For several days then, he would harass and torment the Sascar employees actively working to prevent and reverse his actions, eventually defacing the company's website by having it redirect to a porn site. He would sit on their system for at least 24 hours, with many of Sascar's services still unavailable on the afternoon of March 30th, but it doesn't appear as though any demands were even made of Sascar to return their source code data. This one seemed to have been almost entirely for Sigma's own personal amusement. Also on March 30th, Lapsus would conduct an attack on IT and software consultancy firm Globant, an originally Argentinian company now based in Luxembourg, with a similar role to Okta. Like with Okta, Lapsus would post and brag about having breached Globant's systems to release the source code data for many of their customers to include Abbott, Apple Health App, C-SPAN, Fortune, Facebook, DHL, and ArcServe. They would further claim to have a set of credentials which they said gave them admin access to platforms used by Globant for developing, reviewing, and collaborating on customer code, like Jira, Confluence, GitHub, and Crucible. They would release about 70 gigabytes of data, but the company would attempt damage control as usual, saying in a public statement, 
Certain source code and project-related documentation for a very limited number of clients had been illegally accessed. Those very limited number of clients, though, would include things like the BlueCap app, a financial consultancy application which contained very sensitive customer information. According to reports from the intelligence company SOS Intelligence, the leak was pretty bad, and likely further increased their already red-hot visibility to the FBI and other global law enforcement agencies. The leak would contain customer information and source code repositories with a large number of private keys. Full chain, web server SSL certificates, Globant servers, and API keys. In my opinion, it was likely this leak which directly led to the events of March 31st, although it seems to have already been a question of when at that point, not if. On March 31st, 2022, Sigma's home would be raided, and he would be arrested and brought to court, apparently that day, where he finally faced actual charges. This same day, Amtrak is also arrested a second time, as far as I can tell, as it seems the two were always arrested together, or at least as part of the same operation, usually the same day. Much less is known about Amtrak's arrest, though, due to his age. Sigma's charges, though, according to KT, were... Three counts of unauthorized access to a computer, with intent to impair the reliability of data. One count of fraud by false representation. One count of unauthorized access to a computer with intent to hinder access to data. And one count of causing a computer to perform a function to secure unauthorized access to a program. Apparently, the UK National Health Service also confirmed with KT that the Doxman post on Sigma had been used in the police investigation. Then, also according to KT, he would be released very shortly after, on April 2nd, and given a one-month suspension, barring him from using any computer, but in reality, he would be placed on a strict bail condition and moved to a travel lodge hotel for his own safety under police supervision. His laptop was taken away from him, but that did not stop him. Using nothing but an Amazon Fire Stick, his hotel's smart TV, and a mobile phone, Sigma would carry on hacking. In fact, he would use this rudimentary setup to execute his most audacious attack of all, and the one you've probably been waiting to hear about, I'm sure. There were a few smaller ones first, though. Sometime in mid-September 2022, Sigma would gain access to the neobank and financial technology company Revolut, which provided banking services to its customers. All we know is that Sigma or Lapsus would have access to at least 5,000 customer files, but it's unclear if any of the other trademarks for the group were used, like taking down their website, stealing source code, or making over-the-top demands. Then, two days after infiltrating Revolut, Lapsus would access several internal systems for the ride-sharing company Uber, and temporarily disrupt the company's services for its drivers. Lapsus didn't appear to have obtained any sensitive customer data this time, nor was any ransom demand made, but it may have simply been more amusement for Sigma, at least in terms of notoriety. His masterpiece was still to come. On September 18th, users of the most popular GTA community site, GTA Forums, awoke to a seemingly innocuous post. Some user by the name of Teapot Tuber Hacker would post what they claimed were 90 clips of the then unannounced Grand Theft Auto 6. They would also claim they had much more to leak, including source code for GTA 6 and 5. Now, I bet most people initially dismissed this post. After all, we had been inundated by fake GTA 6 rumors for nearly 10 years at that point, so it wouldn't even be outside the realm of possibility for somebody to try and fake something like this. As the hours drew on, though, people began to realize that this was no joke. Lapsus, and also very specifically Sigma, while under police supervision in a Travelodge hotel using a rudimentary setup, had pulled off one of, if not the, biggest hack in the history of the video games industry. By the next day, outlets across the internet would be reporting on the biggest industry story of the decade. The Guardian's Jason Schreier would confirm with his own trusted sources inside Rockstar that the footage released was genuine. In all, 90 clips containing about 50 minutes total of footage were released. These clips showed in-dev builds that were at least a year old, and in some cases much older, but still revealed a great deal about a game that the world had only learned even existed, officially, back in February of that year. We now finally knew that the game would take place in a modern-day Vice City. We were given level layouts, 
a look at the two protagonists, Jason and Lucia, got to see animation and gameplay tests, the new dialogue system akin to Red Dead 2, and much, much more. None of which I'll be showing on screen for obvious reasons. Sigma would later update their GTA forums post, about 12 hours later apparently surprised at the viral response. He would post on internal Rockstar channels using the Slack messaging service, which also served as a frequent first step in infiltration for lapses, and ask Rockstar to contact him on Telegram to negotiate the release of additional footage and source code. In the immediate aftermath, Rockstar Games would attempt damage control as the post began to spread. They would issue takedown notices and speak with Reddit moderators and forum admins to cleanse the internet as thoroughly as they could of the leaked footage, but as anybody who has spent a lot of time on the internet knows, you can never get it all. The most concerning initial impact, as Rockstar put it, was their employees, which I would love to believe they actually believed themselves, but even if they didn't, it was most certainly true. The incident would severely limit employees' abilities to work remotely as new cybersecurity safeguards were put in place, and more than anything, it would damage morale. The next day, on September 19th, Rockstar would make an official announcement to confirm the veracity of the leaks. They would express disappointment in how the game was first unveiled, but attempt to reassure their customers, and more likely their investors, that they did not anticipate long-term effects on development from the leak. The CEO of Rockstar's parent company, Take-Two, Strauss Zelnick, in response to the leak, said, quote, The incident caused the companies to become more vigilant with cybersecurity, and it impacted staff emotionally, but business remained unaffected. It isn't entirely clear exactly how Lapsus pulled off this hack, but as I mentioned, the messaging service Slack was definitely involved, as it had been for the hacks on Uber and Revolut as well. Slack is a messaging or DM service often used by technology companies for internal company communication. Though Lapsus hadn't always used Slack specifically, they'd already developed a habit of infiltrating similar networks by parlaying their way into greater access by speaking with employees using services like Slack. Somehow, Sigma, likely in collaboration with other members of Lapsus he was still in communication with, managed to get into the internal Rockstar Slack channels, and it's likely that from there they leapfrogged their way into obtaining the source code and leaked footage. But again, it isn't clear exactly how this went down, possibly because not all legal cases surrounding the events have been resolved in court as of the writing of this script as well as the fact that several members of Lapsus are believed to still be at large, as evidenced by the events of December 2023. And so, finally, on September 22nd, 2022, London police would search Sigma's hotel and catch him red-handed with the Amazon Fire Stick, smart TV, and a brand new smartphone, and a keyboard and mouse. He would be arrested for a third and final time and remain in police custody until his initial court date two days later. Amtrak would also be arrested the same day or very close to when Sigma is brought in. On September 24th, Sigma and Amtrak faced a judge, and Sigma was charged with two counts of breach of bail conditions and computer misuse, to which he would plead not guilty to both. He would then be held in a youth detention center until a further trial could be conducted. At the time of his third arrest, Sigma would still be 17, but by the time of his actual trial, he would turn 18, allowing the details of his arrest to be disclosed. A month later, a person in Brazil is also arrested, and I believe this is the person that I have referred to as PG. They were arrested in Fiera de Santana on October 19th, 2022, as part of the Brazilian government's Operation Dark Cloud, which had been in planning since the initial attacks on the Brazilian government offices in late 2021. It remains unclear, but I speculate that PG was indeed over 18, but I did not attempt to track down the details of his arrest or identity. Sigma would then spend a full year in a youth detention center awaiting trial, while the rest of Lapsus, the members not yet identified anyway, likely went on to continue their exploits under different names or as part of different groups, or went dormant in an attempt to stay hidden. In September of 2023, both Sigma and Amtrak would have their full trials. Sigma would be charged with 12 separate offenses, including 6 counts of computer misuse, 3 counts of blackmail, and 2 of fraud. He would be directly implicated as responsible for the BT slash EE hack, NVIDIA, Samsung, Uber, Revolut, and of course, Rockstar Games. Amtrak would presumably be given similar charges, but again, due to his status as a minor, less is known about his case. We do know that Amtrak was sentenced to an 18-month-long youth rehabilitation order, including intense supervision and a ban on using VPNs online. 
Sigma, though, would be reportedly severely violent while in police custody, with several reports of injuries due to his lashing out. You see, something I haven't discussed very much is that Sigma, along with likely several of the other teenage members of Lapsus, had severe autism. A mental health assessment of Sigma prior to his trial would deem him unfit to stand trial, and so in court, the jury would not be asked to determine if he had carried out the attacks with criminal intent, but simply whether he had carried them out at all, which was undeniably the case. Throughout all of this, Sigma would apparently continuously express a desire to return to cybercrime as soon as possible. And so, as a result, in December of 2023, just a month ago at the time of writing this, he would be placed under an indefinite hospital order for being a high public risk. Indefinite, meaning until a judge determines he is no longer a threat, forever. But Sigma and Amtrak being arrested was never really going to be the end of anything. Since it's not always clear what alias is who throughout this whole thing, we don't know exactly who this next person is, but there are still some things we can conclude from the little that we do know. On Christmas Eve 2023, we got one more piece of the puzzle for this still unfolding melodrama of juvenile cybercriminals. A user known as Phil, or perhaps alternatively as Lily, would leak the GTA 5 source code, which had apparently been obtained around the same time as the 6 source code and footage. They would post it in Discord channels, dark web forums, and Telegram channels, and despite being a 10-year-old game, we would once again learn a whole hell of a lot from this leak. Source code, after all, as Sigma would indeed know very well, can be very, very valuable. All in all, we would finally have confirmation of something that many longtime GTA fans had suspected. The initially planned single player DLCs for GTA 5 would all be scrapped in favor of GTA Online updates. We would also get confirmation of other dead projects like the cancelled game Agent, Bully 2, Midnight Club 5, and even something called GTA Tokyo, a concept that I mentioned in my first rumors video that seems to have at least had some truth to it at some point. Phil Lilly, as I'll call them, also expressed an admiration for Sigma in their post releasing the GTA 5 source code. Hashtag free Sigma, he wrote. He started off all of this and ensured the leak would become public. I have immense respect for him. Miss you, buddy. If you want to take a trip down memory lane, check out the list of pinned messages to see how it all unfolded in 2022. Sigma actively talked in here. So whoever Phil Lilly is, it seems likely that they were another juvenile, perhaps even Sigma's junior as they seem to have a genuine admiration for him. Whoever they are, whether it be Amtrak not actually being prevented from going back online or any of the other unidentified members of the group formerly known as Lapsus, they're still out there, and this story is likely not over. In fact, there are already reports that several members from Lapsus moved on to a new hacker collective dubbed Scattered Spider. Like Lapsus, they employ many of the same tactics, such as sim swapping attacks and source code theft, but one thing we know for sure is that this time, Sigma is not involved. Perhaps we'll revisit this story in the future, when Scattered Spider leaks GTA 7 in 2040. So what do we make of all this? Personally, I come away from the exhaustive endeavor of sorting out all of this, thinking that the only real winners here are the unknown actors who couldn't be talked about in this video because we still know nothing about them. The teenage hackers likely end up having their lives ruined. The victims of these various organizations usually have little recourse for compensation. The various companies they target lost money, which almost certainly translated to loss of revenue for staff, firings, or even just the loss of morale. But dozens upon dozens of people, many of whom are probably not teenagers, who helped to prop lapses up or the various groups which preceded and followed it, get to walk away with their hands clean and their wallets probably a little bit heavier. The only other people who benefit from all this are, well, us really. Unless you're the type who personally hates spoilers for games, this is all just entertainment as far as a lot of us are concerned. I mean, we got to see this game, one of the most anticipated of all time, early, and see it in a way that the developers never intended, which is really neat. Things like the GTA 6 mapping project became possible, and so much more. On top of all that, we got this story. The story of how it all happened, which is in and of itself super fascinating, and again, just more entertainment. To us. 
Now I'm not judging, hell, I'm contributing to the problem making this video, but I do want to emphasize, as fun as it was to research and tell this story, this was a lot more than just a story for the people involved. The victims, the younger hackers now facing a life of legal obstacles or outright imprisonment, there was a lot of suffering that went into this story. A lot more than probably the teen hackers realized, but exactly as much as the most nefarious actors involved anticipated. Those, I think, are the real criminals in tonight's story. Not that what Sigma or Amtrak or any of the other teens convicted did was okay, but that in learning this story, I was frequently reminded that there are some people who are much, much worse. I considered doing even more analysis of the tactics Lapsus used, the nature of the group, but as I unwove the web of this narrative, it became clear to me that those things, on top of being well outside my area of expertise, are really not important to the overall story. That's what I wanted to do here tonight is tell a story, but unlike every other video I've ever made, this story is one that actually happened. So please, keep in mind that when leaving your, I'm sure, overwhelmingly positive and not at all toxic comments below, these were real people, and any disclosure of real names in my comments will see you shadow banned from the channel. I want to thank you all for watching this video. I have done my best to make sure that the story I told tonight was as accurate as possible, but if there's anything you notice that is factually incorrect, please either let me know in the comments, message me on Patreon as a free member, or in my Discord. Or if you're really old school like me, you can email me at this address right below. That's GuinnessWalker at gmail.com, Guinness with one N. All the music, animation, and research for this video was done by myself, and all of the links that I used for my research will be found in a document that you can find linked below. I'm the Criminal Historian, and I hope you've enjoyed this video.